Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at in the state. Welcome to the um, Medicaid and Long-Term Care Heritage Health Behavioral Health Provider Webinar. Um, I am Heather Lashinsky, Deputy Director of Delivery Systems, and I'll be giving the welcome and introduction. Um, we will have a period of time where Carmen Buckle from Health and or from Division of Medicaid and Long-Term Care will be giving us a Heritage Health Overview, and then each of our Heritage Health Plans will be giving an overview for their contracting credential and other relevant information for behavioral health providers. Um, we will have an opportunity for question and answers at the end, and you will be able to type your question into the Q&A box in the WebEx, and I will go ahead and let Carmen begin. Thank you all for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first webinar geared specifically towards behavioral health providers. My name is Carmen Bockel, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Division of Medicaid and Long-Term Care. We're going to be focusing on the new Heritage Health Program, which is the state's new managed care integrated delivery system. We have several presenters in our lineup this morning. Joining us from United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska, we have Michael Horn, Chief Medical Officer, Adam Proctor, Licensed Mental Health Practitioner, Behavioral Health Clinical Manager, Connie Duncan, Director of Optum Provider Services. On the line from Well Care of Nebraska, we'll be hearing from Carol Mateus, Vice President of Behavioral Health Operations. And from Nebraska Total Care, we have Michelle Brochu, Senior Director of Network Contracting, Julie Rothacker, Senior Director of Business Development and Clinical Implementations, and Janine Fromm, Behavioral Health Medical Director. Then joining me from the department, in addition to Heather Lashinsky, we also have Lisa Neiman, the Administrator of Health Services, Kimberly McClintock, Administrator, Lori Lewis, Program Coordinator, and Angela Parrish, Program Specialist. They will all help facilitate our question and answer portion. And as Heather mentioned, that Q&A feature is live on the webinar site. So you can feel free to go ahead and submit your questions throughout all of the presentations. And then we'll address as many questions as possible while we're all on the line today. And I would like to let everyone know that the webinar is being recorded. The recording, as well as all of the PowerPoints, will be made available on our Heritage Health webpage after this presentation. So as Heather said, I'm going to begin by going through the presentation to give everyone an overview of what Heritage Health is, the history of managed care in the state, and what it means for our recipients and providers going forward. So after this brief overview, you'll be hearing from each of the health plans regarding their credentialing process. A snapshot of Medicaid in Nebraska today. We currently have approximately 230,000 enrollees at an annual cost of about $1.8 billion in actual health care expenditures that we're reimbursing or that we're paying our health plans for. Our total budget in the division is a little over $2 billion when you include the administrative costs. So the vast majority, as you can see, is financed for the actual health care services. At this time, about 12% of our state's population in Nebraska is eligible for Medicaid. Currently, we have a managed care program. We've had managed care in Nebraska since 1995. What managed care is is a system of health care delivery, which the department contracts with health plans to administer health care benefits and services for our enrollees. Managed care has evolved over a number of years across the country as the states have learned more about how to administer the program, the types of contracts they could enter into, the different federal authorities, and the oversight that exists to help govern the programs. But in Nebraska today, we contract with three regional MCOs, which stands for Managed Care Organization. The MCOs are contracted for physical health services for our enrollees. Physical health services would include hospital visits, doctor's office visits, those routine medical care services. So depending on what part of the state you live in, as a Medicaid recipient, you'll choose from one of two regional health plans for your physical health services. One plan operates statewide, while two others operate in their own regions. So everyone has a choice of two currently. We also have a separate managed care entity for behavioral health services. That's operated statewide. There's one contractor for managing those behavioral health services, and currently that's Magellan. So almost all recipients in Medicaid that receive behavioral health services have those services administered through Magellan. And then we also separately have a pharmacy benefits manager that we contract with to manage the pharmacy services for the entire program and all of the recipients. 
So depending on where you are in the program and what services you're receiving, as a Medicaid recipient in Nebraska today, you could potentially be having three different entities managing your health care services, which can actually increase to four if you include the waiver services or in-home services that we provide. So there can be a lot of disconnect between those different systems, and one of our goals with Heritage Health that I'll talk about today is to help bring those together and create a more coordinated system. Today, about 82% of all of our Medicaid enrollees are enrolled in a physical health managed care plan. So that's nearly everyone. And then with a few very small exceptions, more than 99% are enrolled in the behavioral health managed care plan. In a traditional fee-for-service state-administered program, the state's responsible for contracting with the health care providers that are delivering the services and receiving the claims from them, processing them, and paying for them. But depending on the level of utilization, our level of cost can be somewhat unpredictable. With managed care, we use a captative model in which we make a fixed monthly payment to the managed care organizations, and they are then responsible for managing that provider network and paying those claims. The monthly payments are adjusted based on the level of care that an individual needs, where they live, the relative risk to their health, this approach creates more budget predictability for the state in that we can kind of forecast our needs based on our enrollment trends and then predict how much we're going to be paying each month to the health plan for those services. Those fixed rates are developed by our actuaries. They look at the trend of health care costs, they look nationally at what trends are coming in terms of health care expenditures, and they develop rates that are designed to be inclusive of the cost of health care services. The managed care program also improves efficiency over fee-for-service in that the health plans tend to be better equipped to manage the utilization. They can do care coordination and help lower overall costs by reducing some of the more costly care like emergency room utilization and hospitalization. So to compare those two models, we have the at-risk model, which the payment, as I said, is made to the health plan before the services are delivered, and then the risk is assumed by the managed care organization. Whereas with fee-for-service, the state is paying for those services after the costs have already been incurred. What the fee-for-services system doesn't necessarily do is reward managing better health and having better health outcomes, because oftentimes the state of health is actually a lack of health care, meaning that you're well, you're getting preventative services, and you're not utilizing health care services. So we're trying to shift the model away from that pay for volume and go more toward a pay for value. The first steps towards this goal were made through the past 20 years of managed care, but you'll see that with Heritage Health, we're trying to go a step further by engaging our providers in that equation as well. So one of the key responsibilities of the plans that we've contracted with for Heritage Health is care management, really putting an emphasis on primary care, preventative care, triage and referral out for services like behavioral health and disease management. So identifying through health risk assessments those individuals that have multiple or even a single chronic condition and stratifying them in terms of the level of risk and then plugging them into different care management programs that might have different levels of intervention from very basic telephonic checks just to say, how are you doing? Do you need help scheduling an appointment? Do you need help with transportation services? To the more intensive care management where they have an assigned care manager in the community that may be going out to their home and visiting with them and checking up with them at different levels. So we want to see different risk stratification, different levels of care management. Quality management is really having a more formal structure, a formal plan for what are our goals around quality, what are the metrics that we're prioritizing that we're measuring our performance by for the health outcomes. You'll see lots of national performance metrics included like HEDIS measures, which are national measure sets around the healthcare quality and outcomes, member surveys and member experience surveys about their level of access to care, their level of satisfaction with their provider, their satisfaction with their health plan, and also more focused on engaging the health plans and helping us with performance improvement projects. So identifying priorities, areas of concern, areas where we see opportunities to improve, and focusing our efforts around them. Utilization management is another key responsibility. Looking prospectively at pre-certifying or pre-authorizing certain services before they can be administered to make sure that they fit within the clinical guidelines, that they're at the right level of care, and that they meet our medical necessity criteria. Concurrent review, for example, working with the provider for discharge planning when an individual is ready to leave the hospital to help determine what the right timing is, what the next level of care looks like, and making sure that there's follow-up and continuity of services. So are they getting their prescriptions filled? Are they getting connected in the home health as necessary? Then the retrospective review, looking at claims to give resources and insight about what those utilization patterns look like and maybe help lower that cost and improve their outcomes. 
Provider Network Management. One of the big reasons the states have moved towards managed care is that there are a lot of federal regulations that really limit the state's ability to truly manage the program. Health plans are better equipped and actually have better flexibility to do that. One of the ways is around managing a provider network. Being able to have individualized agreements with different providers that build in certain outcome metrics or reimbursement priority criteria. And also making sure that they have policies for continued access whenever providers change with someone that's there to assist you in transitioning from one provider to the next, potentially if they leave the network or stop providing Medicaid services. And then having provider education. People that can go out to be on the site with the provider, help the provider with billing issues, claim issues, or the latest medical guidelines that are available. So what's happening with Heritage Health? We've had managed care, as I said, for a number of years in Nebraska with physical health and then the separate behavioral health. Medicaid and long-term care has now entered into contracts with three health plans, Well Care of Nebraska, Nebraska Total Care or Centene, and United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska. Each of these health plans will operate statewide and provide integrated health care services, which include physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy services to all enrollees beginning on January 1st of 2017. We're working diligently to make this transition, including readiness, provider education, planning the enrollment period for members to select and enroll in their health plan, and making sure that the provider networks are prepared for the transition. While each of the managed care organizations maintain their own credentialing process, one universal feature is that each of the plans will accept provider credentialing information through the Council for Affordable Quality Health Care. It's important to note that providers enrolled with CAQH will need to ensure that their profile is up to date and has been attested to within the past six months. Additionally, each of the Heritage Health MCOs will need to be selected as an approved payer in order to access that CAQH profile. With all the goals of the program that we've identified, improved health outcomes is the number one goal. We want to focus on seeing better quality and better outcomes for our recipients, better integration of services with better care coordination across physical, behavioral, and pharmacy services, having an emphasis on a person-centered approach toward identifying an individual's needs and wrapping services around them, care management, more preventative services, more recovery-oriented care, and reducing the rate of cost and avoidable care. So really trying to examine emergency room utilization for non-emergency needs, hospitalization, re-hospitalization that is unnecessary, just having those metrics in place and engaging the plans and providers to help us address those. Then of course, the improved financial sustainability of the system. As we bring more services, more populations into risk-based managed care, it creates better budget predictability for us and hopefully lowers the cost growth curve to a manageable level so that we can stay at an annual growth rate that allows us to be sustainable. One of the big changes, as I said, under Heritage Health is the integration of behavioral health services. This is really designed to help us better identify and manage individuals that have concurring behavioral health and physical health needs. In fact, there's a lot of data that suggests that individuals with behavioral health often have unmet physical health needs or chronic conditions, and the cost of treating those chronic conditions for an individual with serious mental illness can be many times higher. Their compliance rates are poor, they're in and out of the hospital more often, they're in and out of the emergency room more often, and individuals with serious mental illness live on average 25 years less. So we really want to put a lot of focus on making sure that we're identifying those individuals and wrapping the right services around them. And part of that is just by bringing them together under one contract. You have one entity that's now contractually and financially incentivized and obligated to look across that full spectrum. With the current system today, there's often confusion about who's paying for what. If an individual shows up at the emergency room, is the primary need physical or is it behavioral? Who's responsible for them? This split in coverage can limit the motivation to make the investments in the preventative behavioral health and community-based services. So by bringing all of these services together, you create better incentives to make those investments on the front end. We also know that this is a big change for our system, for our providers, for our staff, to go from having one behavioral health contractor that everyone deals with to having three. So one of the steps that we've taken was the creation of the Behavioral Health Integration Advisory Committee, 
which includes Medicaid, along with the Division of Behavioral Health, the plans, various providers and advocates, all at the table planning and making sure that we're thinking through all the different things that we need to make this a smooth transition into 2017. The advisory committee is fully staffed and has been meeting monthly since May. These are open meetings, so anyone that would like to bring their ideas to the table has the opportunity to do so during the public comment portion of each meeting. We're also introducing some new populations into managed care through Heritage Health. Currently, some of the groups that are excluded from the physical health managed care, meaning they're completely in the fee-for-services system for those needs, are individuals who participate in home and community-based waiver programs, like the Aged and Disabled Waiver, the Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver, and waivers for individuals with developmental disabilities. Those waivers provide in-home care services or other community support services for individuals that have these long-term care needs. A lot of these enrollees also have significant physical health and behavioral health needs. So under Heritage Health, they will be able to benefit from the advantages of care coordination and having a health plan for their physical health, pharmacy, and behavioral health services. In addition, individuals that live in institutional settings like nursing homes or intermediate care facilities for people with developmental disabilities, those institutional level of care clients will also be in Heritage Health. So while all of those individuals are new to managed care and they'll have their benefits coordinated through their Heritage Health Plan, their actual long-term support services, those actual in-home services or residential services, those will continue to be authorized and paid as they are today. So the Heritage Health Plans initially are only taking over responsibility for their hospital, doctor's office, pharmacy, and community behavioral health services. Some of the key features that you'll see in the contracts is a greater focus on quality, care management, and introduction, introducing the concept of social determinants of health into the health plan's responsibility. We have formalized structures to have cross-divisional partnerships for managing the program and working with the health plans. Performance metrics that are specific to our Medicaid members that are identified in the contract and can be updated with the impact of our quality committee, which met for the first time in June and will continue to meet quarterly. A bigger onus on health plans to help identify those early needs for care management through those health risk assessments. And then making sure that they're not just looking at the health care needs or behavioral health needs of the individual, rather that they're utilizing the overall health risk assessment strategy and care management strategy and identifying individuals who have other social needs. So whether that's food security or housing needs, we can help connect those individuals into other community and state resources that are available to assist them. Common sense as well as strong data suggest that an individual who's chronically homeless and diabetic is going to have a harder time managing their diabetes and is going to spend more time in the emergency room than someone who's not. If you're worried about where you're going to sleep tonight, it's difficult to manage your blood sugar. So really trying to help identify what those needs are and address them so that the individual, their health plan, and their provider can focus on their specific health care needs. There are requirements in the contracts for developing and building provider networks that meet geographic time and distance standards. Based on where the member lives for all the different types of providers, hospitals, specialists, primary care physicians, pharmacies, behavioral health providers, as well as substance abuse disorder and allied health providers. So lots of focus on primary and preventative care, making sure everyone has an assigned primary care physician. One of the ways that we want to begin to measure is can people actually connect with these providers? Are they accepting patients? Are they able to schedule an appointment? So those metrics are all included as well. And then continuing that focus on the health plans, helping providers develop patient-centered medical homes and meeting those criteria. Accountability is a big thing throughout Heritage Health. We have strong contracts at the foundation that clearly set out what our expectations are and what our performance standards are. And then we want to make sure we have policies and procedures in place that really hold them accountable. So all of their policies and procedures have to be reviewed and approved by us. We have numerous reporting requirements on both operational and outcome performance metrics for everything from their call center performance time, their claim processing timeliness, to those actual outcomes and HEDIS metrics. Plans are required to give us full access to all of their systems and information. We will be conducting periodic operational and readiness reviews prior and after we go live. There are also financial incentives, sanctions and penalties built into the contracts and tied to their performance. They have to deposit 1.5% of their total revenues into a reinvestment account that they have to earn by meeting certain quality metrics. 
there are financial sanctions and intermediate sanctions in place, if they don't meet certain contractual responsibilities, then those quality metrics that are tied to performance standards will be revisited annually with the input of our quality committee. We also want to make sure that we're supporting our providers. Managed care is not always fun for healthcare providers, and admittedly, we're adding additional layers of administrative complexity to the system. Under the traditional fee-for-service model, there's only one entity to bill, which is the state. So health plans do add that additional layer, but those plans are making sure that there's proper concurrent review, utilization management, accurate billing, and ensuring providers are credentialed properly. So while we recognize those challenges, we do think there's value in creating those layers. But we also want to make sure that there aren't layers of administrative complexity that don't add value to the system. So we have contractual requirements, making sure that they have timely processing, timely payment, timely credentialing, application processing, so those standards are all set there. We're also going to require that they continue to follow our state preferred drug list. Even though they are managing the pharmacy benefit, they will have to follow our PDL. So prescribers won't have to navigate multiple different preferred drug lists to figure out which specific drug they should prescribe for a member depending on which health plan they're enrolled in. There are a lot of requirements for the plans to engage in provider training and making sure providers are ready to bill in their system and that they understand their policies and procedures. Having dedicated provider support staff available in our state on the ground ready to assist providers and that they also individually have provider advisory committees with Nebraska providers to meet regularly and provide input about operational issues and a provider complaint system. We also have an administrative simplification committee that meets regularly with state staff, health plans, and providers to focus specifically on these issues and continuously identify opportunities where maybe we can create some consistent policies across health plans, consistent health forms, or other areas where we can knock out any administrative complexity that's not adding value. So speaking of value, we really wanted to focus on value within these contracts. One of the ways that we're trying to tackle that is that the health plans are required at certain points in their contract to have certain percentages of their provider network in value-based contracts. And what that means is in their contracts with the provider to provide services for the members, they have to have some element of quality outcome or cost metrics that they're engaged with the health plan in meeting. And then there are also financial incentives to meet those, whether that's performance payment, shared savings methodology or subcapitation, which is when they actually pay the providers a fixed monthly rate, managing their patient populations while taking on some of that risk as well. There's multiple different ways that plans and providers can enter into those types of arrangements, but we didn't want to be terribly prescriptive because we want plans and providers to determine what works best for them and what works best for their type of practice. So for example, you might begin with an upside only shared savings where the provider only gains if they save money but doesn't necessarily lose if they don't and then evolve over time to a true shared savings and loss where they take on some risk. There are several ways that they can tackle this, but we wanted providers to be engaged and have the same incentives as the health plans to manage care, create better outcomes, and to lower cost. Under the current system, you've got this constant tension between the payer and the provider where one makes money while the other loses money. So we want to try and ease and reduce some of that tension that exists. A big focus, obviously, for us is on our members. They're at the heart of what the program is all about, and it wouldn't exist without them. So we've got to make sure that we have strong protections in place for actually engaging them in the program. Making sure the health plans are providing them with timely and accurate information, that it's accessible, it's at the right level, of, it's at the right level with the correct information in it, that they have a toll-free call center, that they're meeting those performance standards, that their grievance process is extensive, it's approved by us, ensuring they will always have access to the state fair hearing process as a step beyond those initial MCO appeals, and that they do member surveys using national standards. The CAP survey, which is a national health plan recognized survey process, which can measure objectively kind of what the member experience looks like by health plan, and then member choice, we want to make sure that the members are engaged in choosing their health plans now and that the, during the open enrollment period, if they're not satisfied, they can choose a different health plan. One of the ways we're doing that is by expanding our enrollment broker capabilities. Our enrollment broker will be assisting the members with their choice to find the plan that best fits their needs. We want the members to select their plan to have that voice in their care. When absolutely necessary, if the member is unable to choose a plan, then the enrollment broker will have the responsibility of auto-assigning members to the plan that meets their individual needs. 
We want to support our partners across the division and other state programs as well. There are clear requirements that the Heritage Health plans have liaisons and coordinate with sister DHHS divisions to have them participate in our committees. Behavioral health and developmental disabilities, children and family services will be involved for the youth that are in foster care as those youth that are in the system will be receiving services through Heritage Health. Bringing various representatives together will give us better alignment and coordination. This expands beyond DHHS as well. There's the Department of Education, Office of Probation, other community and local agencies. We want to bring everyone to the table and have expectations that the health plans are communicating and coordinating with. And then, like I said, we want to make sure we have a smooth transition. The plans will have to submit to us for approval their transition and implementation plans. We're currently immersed in our collaborative implementation period. There are key staffing requirements that are in place throughout this time period, specifying which roles need to be filled to ensure a presence throughout the time frame leading up to 2017. Additionally, they have to have their network in place three months before we go live to make sure that we'll be able to assess if they're meeting our network requirements and that their members are prepared to transition to those providers by January 1st of 2017. There are also continuity of care provisions that require that any services that have been pre-authorized for a certain period of time after the contract starts will have to be authorized, even if it's out of network, for a certain period after we go live. I briefly mentioned our enrollment broker. We've contracted with automated health systems to provide this service. A key principle for Heritage Health is member choice. So AHS will provide member outreach and support during the open enrollment period to, to help individuals determine which health plan best meets their needs. Their contract includes letters alerting the members of the open enrollment period, phone calls to provide any necessary counseling as they review their options, and searchable databases for primary care providers. We want to make sure that we have regular communications about what's happening and what's going on. We've created the Heritage Health branding to help create a unified picture of what the program looks like. We've launched web pages where you can go and learn more about Heritage Health. There's links to the procurement materials, the RFP, and the contracts. Our presentation materials and handouts will all be posted there, including all of the PowerPoints that you'll see today. We've also posted an FAQ that's being continually updated throughout this process, and we have a link where additional questions can be submitted to our subject matter experts. The clock is ticking down to 2017, and we have a lot of information to broadcast about Heritage Health. So we're taking proactive steps in communications to ensure that we have significant stakeholder involvement as we move forward. So where are we today? This is a broad overview of what the timeline looks like. And as I mentioned before, we're in the midst of the implementation process. Our committees for quality management, behavioral health integration, and administrative simplification are all now in full swing. Those committee meetings are part of the Nebraska public meeting calendar with agendas and meeting materials provided on our website. We're looking ahead to our readiness reviews, actively planning the open enrollment approach with AHS, and keeping our site set on that go live date of January 1, 2017. Again, I just want to emphasize that our focus is on unity. We know that we're better together, so each of the divisions within the department are present at the table. We're all collaborating to work together on this. Even though it's a Medicaid program and Medicaid contracts, the entire agency touches base with these same clients across different programs. At the heart of it, we're all trying to work together to deliver better services for people and deliver better value for the taxpayers. So we want to make sure that we have good communication as we move forward with Heritage Health. The web page for Heritage Health is being updated regularly, and any questions about Heritage Health can be submitted through the link on that web page or by emailing us directly, dhhs.heritagehealth.nebraska.gov. So I'd like to thank you all for your time today and encourage you to subscribe to that web page for our updates and to email our office with any specific questions. So at this time, we'll welcome United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska to share information with us as it relates to their plan. Thank you, Carmen. I'm Dr. Michael Horn. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska. And I'd like to start off by sharing some health plan facts with you. Next slide. So United Healthcare has been operating in the state of Nebraska since 1984. 
Currently, there are over 428,000 individuals covered by our plan in the state of Nebraska. And we have over 328 employees in Nebraska. United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska is our Medicaid managed care plan. And we've been operating in the state for 20 years now. And I'm proud to say that we've been accredited by the NCQA since August of 2005. If you look over to the right-hand side of the slide, you will see what our current network looks like. And we are a broad and statewide plan. Next slide, please. So United Behavioral Health, or UBH, began on February 2nd, 1997, through the merger of U.S. Behavioral Health and United Behavioral Systems. United Behavioral Health, operating under the brand Optum, is a division of United Healthcare Group, and you may see communications from us labeled as both UBH and Optum. So our community plan and our Optum uh, partners have been designing the process by which we will more, more tightly and firmly integrate the delivery of physical and behavioral health services. And before I speak to that plan, I'd like to first share with you what motivates and informs us. Next slide, please. We've worked hard to have a strong and consistent approach to culture. That includes integrity, honoring our commitments and never compromising our ethics, compassion, walking in the shoes of the people we serve and with the people we work with, relationships, building trust through collaboration, innovation, inventing the future, and of course performance as we strive for excellence in everything we do. And with that, I'm gonna hand off to Adam, if you'd bring the next slide up, please. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Uh, Madam Proctor, the Behavioral Health Manager for the plan, and I want to introduce uh, our clinical model, our whole person care team uh, care management process. This is an exciting process and, and really promotes our ability to achieve our goal, which is to integrate behavioral, pharmacy, and uh, physical health care for all members who need it and really interweave a greater level of integration for behavioral health and substance use services in the delivery of the product for, for the members that we all serve. Um, our whole person care model is member-centric, and uh, an important part of it is that we'll have one leader for that uh, care management team will be a single point of contact for that member. Yet within that, we'll have the ability to flex in a variety of different uh, peer opportunities, community health workers, care advocates, and really function as a liaison then to that broader group of providers in the community, whether it be a PCP or a behavioral health clinician. Our goal is not to duplicate any of the community-based services that are being provided out there in the provider community, but really to help promote connection, coordination, and liaison with those services to strengthen the, the clinical and, and uh, patient relationship so that they're seeing the appropriate people at the appropriate time and that our system partners are also engaged uh, in the coordination and information sharing process so that that member can have that integrated value that the plan offers. Uh, next slide, please. So as I identified, one of the key components of our, of our care management model will be the opportunity to have a recovery and resiliency team with peer support specialists as well as, as, well as a recovery and resiliency manager. And the lived experience benefit to behavioral health uh, members and the ability for those folks to help them coordinate and navigate the system is an extremely important element, as many of you know, to the overall recovery process having someone that they can relate to, having that lived experience component in person who they can identify with is an essential piece to the overall care process and well-being for a member. Next slide, please. The other key part, as I mentioned before, is that our care navigators are gonna function as a single point of contact, and they have the ability to work with members who have SPMI, complex behavioral health, and comorbid medical conditions, and have the ability then to flex those other providers or those other health plan uh, staff in who have that expertise to help meet those services. 
The care, nav the care navigators are that primary collaborative partner. They help with the comprehensive plan develop treatment plan development, uh, coordinating and connecting to the therapeutic services, the community and psychosocial supports, uh, and any other services related to the social determinants of health care. As Carmen mentioned in her initial presentation, that's a key factor here. Within our care management model, we have resources such as our Healthify tool, which has the ability based on geographic location to help our team and help members identify specific community-based resources in their areas to address potential housing, food, and other basic social service needs. Um, specifically for members with SPMI, we have the ability to tailor engagement strategies to support the whole person related to their medication adherence, develop individualized communication strategies for coordination with the key individuals, including family in their lives, and specifically message targeted gaps in their care to them uh, based on their service history and what they're needing. Next slide, please. Um, we continue to work with Heritage Health as well as the various behavioral health committees and work groups that are out there related to our prior authorization processes. But at a high level, just wanted to identify uh, a couple of our different elements. We offer, uh, we'll be offering a telephonic process as well as a, an online portal process for the uh, request of authorizations. Uh, so key contact information is identified on here as well as some high level bullets as to you know, some general things that you uh, can anticipate, uh, and then we'll uh, look forward to continuing to work uh, with the various entities out there on the prior authorization process as we move forward with Heritage Health. Next slide, please. Uh, we also, uh, through our network development process, are looking to build our telemental health service network. Uh, currently, we are contracting with various providers who have telemental health capabilities that meet federal and state requirements and are promoting the ability to have uh, integrated service delivery at PCP offices as well as other specialty provider sites across the state uh, with access to originating sites uh, statewide through our, through our opt-in behavioral contracting process. We will be identifying telemental health providers on our, our live and work well site as well as our provider lookup so they'll be uh, easily identifiable for members and we will continue to recruit and seek to grow our telemental health capabilities uh, within the state as we continue our development for Heritage Health. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass the presentation on to Connie Duncan, our Director of Optum Provider Services. Connie? Thank you, Adam. Hopefully, uh, those of you who are not currently at, contracted with United Behavioral Health have received our um, letter inviting you to join the network and the attached materials that you have been asked to complete and uh, return to us. However, if you have not received one of our letters and you are interested in joining the network, you can easily uh, access that by going to our provider portal as shown there with the web address, completing the network request form, and completing the CAQ, uh, CAQH universal application at uh, CAQH. We are participating in CAQH to assure the ease for our network providers in responding to all of the, all of the various health, health plans. We are also, uh, once we receive your application, we will send back to you a uh, signed provider agreement and a disclosure of ownership form, which we would ask you to review and uh, complete and return to us. If you are an agency or a group, a CMHC or an FQHC that has behavioral services, we will be uh, executing group agreements with the agency that will cover each of the providers under that agency. With facilities, uh, we work directly to contract our facilities uh, and are engaged with facilities here in Nebraska in those network discussions. If you believe your organization may not be engaged with us, please contact us at the phone number or the email address as identified here on this slide. Next slide, please. If you are currently contracted with Optum and are wondering what you need to do to participate in the Heritage Health Program through your Optum contract, 
you will not need to do anything. You are automatically added to the network under Heritage Health. We did send out our notification letters in March to our network providers, which included the uh, Nebraska Medicaid regulatory appendix, amending the contract, and the Medicaid fee schedule. We will be revising our fee schedule based on the various adjustments uh, that the state is making and we'll be submitting those fee schedules back to each of our network providers prior to the January 1st go live. If you believe you have not received a notification uh, that included the regulatory appendix and the current fee schedule, please give us a contact uh, at the email address that you see there and we will personally outreach you and work with you to assure that you have the necessary information for uh, extending your contract for the Nebraska Heritage Program. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk with you a little bit now about our provider relations model. We uh, feel that our provider advocates are your navigational guides through the United Healthcare system. We do have two behavioral health specific provider advocates here in Nebraska that are here to service your needs. Jessica Weikert, you'll see her email address there, and Tracy Gandara Moore, the, also with her email address there. They are your, as I mentioned, your guides. They're your navigational specialists. They uh, are the experts in the uh, products that we offer and can assure that you get your, your services and your needs met. They focus specifically on our providers and uh, work on the relationships with our providers and with our with United Healthcare. So if you've got claims concerns or questions that you might have or how to uh, manage working through our our website, those are your personal advocates to the system. Feel free to outreach either of them at any time. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to talk with you just a little bit. These are some of the processes that as network providers you might be interested in getting some information on. We do accept claims both electronically and via paper. Our electronic claims can be uh, accepted through a variety of clearinghouses. Some of them are noted here on this slide, but those are certainly not all inclusive. Uh, we work with almost all clearinghouses. So if you do have a question about yours, again, outreach your network ab uh, provider advocate and they can certainly work with you along those lines. Secure uh, the, the portal is also an option for submitting your claims. You see an email address and a um, paper address if you choose to submit claims uh, via paper. When you do submit your claims, make sure that your member subscriber ID number is there. Uh, the payer, I, Optum's pay, excuse me, United Healthcare's payer ID is also showing there for the community plan claims. The um, phone number, if you're having issues or would like to get further clarification, and uh, web address are shown at the bottom as well of this slide. On the next slide, I'd like to talk with you just a little bit about provider resources. Uh, United Healthcare does use LINK, and you see the uh, instructions there for how, how to register for LINK and how to sign in. Uh, that is your portal into the United Healthcare online where you find certain resources such as how to submit claims. Uh, how to provide prior authorization and prior notice of admissions, as well as checking on member eligibility. At United Healthcare Community Plan's website, you'll find documents that are specific to the Heritage Health Program. You'll find administrative guides and reimbursement and clinical policies there. This next slide shows a little bit about the important key phone numbers, addresses uh, that you may find that you would like to have as you work with us through the Heritage Health Program. You can see the phone numbers there for such things as prior authorization, uh, customer service, et cetera. You also see the um, 
addresses for submitting paper claims and more information on electronic claims. You can also check the status of a claim that you have submitted and, and watch it as it processes through our system with the information on this slide. On the next slide, we'd like to give you some key contacts for United Healthcare Community Plan. In addition to your provider advocates, you can see an, uh, the listing of, an, of the, a number of individuals that were more than willing to work with you. As a network provider, I would like to identify at, uh, in the bottom third, you will see my name, Connie Duncan, and below that, Allison, Slot, uh, Allison Scheid. In addition to your provider advocates, we are here to meet your needs. You'll see our phone numbers and our addresses there. Feel free to use them. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Next, we will move to WellCare of Nebraska. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Carol Matus, and I'm the Vice President of Behavioral Health for WellCare. And we can move to the first slide. Um, WellCare of Nebraska is part of uh, well care health plans and well care is a specialty health plan that provides services to Medicaid and Medicare members across the country. We have um, Medicaid products in nine states and Medicare in 14 states as well as a PDP product uh, for pharmacy in all states. Uh, we currently serve about 1.4 million uh, lives under our health plan services, and we're very excited to be part of the Well Care of Nebraska and the Nebraska uh, Heritage Plan. Um, well Care of Nebraska's behavioral health program is a fully integrated part of our health plan. And uh, we as a company have an integrated model of care. We do not have a separate behavioral health organization. So everything that operates in Well Care of Nebraska will operate under the, the, um, the same structure with the same leadership, uh, accountable for both um, the medical and behavioral side of things. And we, within the organization, we have a number of behavioral health uh, subject matter experts uh, on both the clinical and the provider side to assist you as you move through uh, the contracting, credentialing, and working with our organization. Uh, we do have BH specific experience staff that is located in Nebraska and um, both in our case management model and our provider relations team and our leadership team. WellCare in Nebraska views our providers as partners, and we want them to participate in developing our innovations and movement towards value-based purchasing. So as we get into the, this implementation, um, we certainly have to go through the process of, of getting everyone signed on and uh, having a fee structure and a contract to start with. But we, we really do want to sit down and talk with you as providers in the in the state about uh, moving forward with innovations as we implement our programs there. Our care model is inclusive of community-based treatment providers in addressing the whole person needs. Next slide. So the behavioral health integrated model of care, we just have some basic principles that we operate on, and that is um, primarily a whole person orientation. We are looking to find ways to have um, an experience for our members that will give them all the care they need in a uh, seamless and coordinated fashion. We're very interested in making sure that our members have access to services, and we know that in Nebraska there has been an extensive amount of work done uh, previous to the managed care implementation around really trying to um, get feedback and input on where there are service gaps in these and how uh, we can participate with providers and stakeholders to address them. So we're interested in working with you on promoting wellness and self-care programs. We want to promote the use of health homes for case management to assure that coordination and unified treatment planning is happening. 
And we know that there's a lot of development to do around that, but we're very interested in starting sooner than later to have those conversations as we roll out our program there. Um, part of our principles include a 24-7 crisis program for members, and that's crisis uh, to address any of the needs that the health care needs that they may, may be presenting with. Next slide. So a little bit more about our in integrated model. Um, our model is designed to connect members with their treating providers. We have algorithms that try to deal with our uh, high need members. If you are an organization or a provider that uh, serves the high need uh, complex populations, uh, we want to work with you to develop the case management model. We realize that members often face uh, multiple case managers because they're uh, touching multiple systems, and we're very uh, interested in making sure that we're not, uh, one, duplicating that, but also, two, not creating excessive burden on providers or members with um, multiple layer case management structure that keeps people uh, confused and not coordinated. So we work very hard to develop and design our care model around uh, working with what works best for the members, both in the community and, and uh, uh, in delivery of their health care needs. Network and a participating network, uh, we're very excited to have you working with us um, and want to expand uh, our relationship with you, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next few slides. Next slide. So we recognize that uh, behavioral health populations require coordination with community-based providers, especially the uh, seriously mentally ill adults and the SED, seriously, serious emotional disturbance, uh, children and adolescents. We know that specific and deliberate care coordination when transitioning from hospital to community is important. So as we get to know you and you us, we will be working with you on uh, transition planning and hospital discharge planning. We will have behavioral health specific staff on our team internally to coordinate and assist uh, providers with this. For adults, community-based case management, in some states known as targeted case management, uh, through community mental health providers, we, uh, we believe that those structures in your organizations who provide those services really do promote the recovery efforts and uh, reduce hospital admissions, and we're looking to uh, learn more about that with you and to also promote uh, ways to make um, services available for folks. For children and adolescents, coordination of multiple systems is a, is, a, is a must, and we understand that. So family, school, juvenile justice, community stakeholders, um, how do we collaborate and coordinate across those systems to best serve our members? Next slide. One of the uh, features of WellCare's program is a community advocacy and outreach model. So in addition to behavioral health experts being available to you in, your, in Nebraska, we are also setting up our um, advocacy and community-based programs, and we'll have staff that work uh, with you to link social services and, um, and community-based uh, systems with you, with us, so, so that we have a um, strategy around serving the social detriment of, of care and, and helping address the social detriments of care so that our members can um, actually get the health care they need. And we feel it's very important that we work towards um, making sure that they have uh, those social environmental needs met in order to get to be able to have their health care needs met, whether they're behavioral or medical. And we all know how important that is, and we have a whole department within our company that, it, that serves and addresses those issues. Next slide. 
So just a little bit about utilization management. As a managed care company, we are pretty much um, looking to have prior authorization on the higher levels of care. And um, we are working um, to, uh, to get a prior authorization grid that would be Nebraska specific. Um, we do have three ways in which prior authorization can be requested. Um, we have a, severe, a secure provider portal, fax, and um, we do have telephonic, telephonic authorization for especially the inpatient levels of care. This is uh, just a general listing of uh, levels of care that we do seek uh, prior authorization on. Next slide. So essentially for uh, outpatient services, emergency crisis services, medication management, all the E&M codes, uh, the things related to standard outpatient, we do not require prior authorization on those services. Next slide. As part of our utilization management program, we do have a number of clinical uh, care criteria and clinical coverage guidelines that we do access and use. And as we develop our provider uh, system in Nebraska, we will be making sure that on our Nebraska provider website, all of our level of care criteria are specifically um, av made available, that we do have um, forms and discussion around this. I know that the state is setting up these work groups that we are all going to be collectively discussing these kinds of issues, but I wanted to list a few of the uh, kinds of criteria that WellCare uses to uh, assess level of care criteria and clinical breast practice. Next slide. So we do post on our web portal for all providers and, and um, um, availability of clinical coverage guidelines, and they are they are uh, tools that allow providers to search evidence-based practice guidelines and um, give you available resources for um, looking at medical necessity criteria. Clinical practice guidelines are developed uh, when we have specific um, uh, best practice recommendations and uh, we do use national data and um, best practice, nationally published best practice strategies when we do develop guidelines. And on our portal, we have an authorization lookup tool that will be uh, available to you that um, is an easy way to verify um, the, um, the authorization services. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about credentialing. Uh, WellCare does follow the NCQA credentialing requirements. We have um, mailed out um, a contract and credentialing application to all the providers that we had on the state Medicaid file. Um, for individual providers, a complete, completed credentialing application our recently attested CAQH number is needed to do our primary source verification. When you get your uh, contract and application, there is a che checklist on the front page with the letter that gives you specific uh, details of what documents you need to submit and um, what information we will be using to credential. You will be contacted by a staff member if we receive an application and or a contract that is not complete. And we will try to work with you directly to get uh, all your information back in, a, in an expeditious manner. If complete, you will, um, once complete, we do have regular and ongoing credentialing committee meetings which we push completed applications through. And um, once complete, you'll be receive a written notification that you have been uh, credentialed. And um, next slide. With that written notification, you will be issued a provider ID that will give you access into the portal uh, that is not publicly published. So you would then get a provider access 
into the portal to get access to all the other documents and claims information and all the other things that you need. So on ancillary credentialing, we do have a facility agency credentialing process. Facilities that bill under 110 and under one group NPI number uh, will get an application that is um, a four-page application that asks for organizational information and credential. If you are a community mental health center, a substance abuse treatment center, residential treatment center, or other uh, facility-based provider, we would not need to be doing the individual credentialing of all of your providers. We do, however, uh, like to know uh, the number and types of providers that you have in your um, organization and may ask you for um, a roster of providers in, in locations that might be associated. That is, we realize that it's not uh, possible to keep up with that, so it's not required that we have a upde updated and detailed list of all your providers, but the providers do need to have the proper credentials to serve your, the members, um, but as long as you're billing under the 110 and the one group NPI number, we don't do the individual credentialing. Next slide. Okay, so providers properly credentialed in 2016 will have a contract effective date of January 1 to coincide with the launch of Heritage Health. For, for providers who submit their contracts and are credentialed after January 1, uh, contracts will be affected the first day of the following month. And again, you'll receive a letter advising you of your contract effective date along with an executed con copy of your contract. The letter will also include the new well care provider identification and instructions on how to register as a participating provider in our website. If we go live July, January 1 and you are still not uh, credentialed in our network, you go live as a non-PAR, but because there, as mentioned earlier, there is a transition of care period where previous authorizations and working with you for the period of transition would um, still be appropriate. We would need some minimal information if you are not going to become a part of our network in order to be able to pay you through transition. And one of our provider relations reps or network folks would be working with you on what that information might be. Next slide. So a little bit about claims. Um, claims must be submitted within 180 days of the date of service. They'll be processed and paid or denied within 15 business days of receipt. These are our general parameters. Uh, the daily check runs for both paper checks and electronic fund transfer payments, except for Sundays and the last day of each month. So there are, we do process claims on a daily basis. Next slide. You can submit claims to WildCare in three ways. Uh, the electronic submission, the electronic data interchange, and uh, WellCare, WellCare's preferred clearinghouse is Relay Health. Um, we do have ways to work with others, but we work, if you work through Relay Health, um, that is our preferred clearinghouse. Direct date entry through the secure web, web portal is possible for submission. And here is the address for submission of paper claims. Next slide. So for context for now, um, Carol Maidas, I'm the Vice President of Behavioral Health Operations. Nicole Drellis is our Behavioral Health Program Clinical Manager. And Jason Young is our Director of Behavioral Health Network Services. For specific credentialing and contracting questions, um, Jason is your primary contact. And his numbers are there. Next slide. So additional important contracts. For questions and support to request a contract, you can email network, the, the email there or make a phone call to um, that number or fax. 
And then our local contact for network um, is Tracy Smith. And I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Carol. Next up, we have Nebraska Total Care. Good afternoon. This is Michelle Brochu, um, Senior Director of Network Development for Nebraska Total Care. And I'd like to thank you all for your participation today in this informational WebEx. Uh, next slide. Um, a few things that I wanted to share with you before we get into the details on contracting and credentialing is um, while Nebraska Total Care is new to Nebraska, we are not new to Medicaid. Uh, we have um, today operating in 28 states Medicaid plans under our parent organization, Centene. And to that end, we believe in uh, a local approach um, with creation of local jobs and uh, local staff managing the care of um, Heritage Health members. We will also believe and do believe in care coordination in a full integrated model. Therefore, our staff is fully integrated for both physical health and behavioral health. And we believe in um, cultural sensitivity since we have a wide range of populations, um, ethnic backgrounds of members enrolled in Heritage Health. So I'm going to cut to the chase on this Friday afternoon and talk about the credentialing and contracting pieces. A lot of what you're going to hear me say is pretty consistent with um, the other two managed care organizations so that we can help streamline the process for all of you. Um, contents of packets that you would re receive is um, you received a welcome letter, which also included a participation provider, a participating provider agreement, which is your contract. There's some marketing pieces of information relative to who Nebraska Total Care is, a provider data form, and a disclosure of ownership form. Next slide. We believe in any willing provider um, to be part of our provider network that gives us a robust network and provides for the best possible access for our members. There are specific components to the agreement which include some state um, standard language, contract language, the state mandated language, rate exhibits, and delegated credentialing agreements where appropriate. Next slide. This slide is pretty self-explanatory, but it gives you an idea of the elements that are required for credentialing. Um, it's everything from an application to DEA certificates, liability coverage, malpractice settlements, et cetera. All of these pieces are required um, for a complete and clean credentialing packet for processing. Next slide. There's also a complete credentialing packet here as well for organizations, um, a little less extensive, um, but does provide some of the same items as it relates to your accreditation, liability coverage, uh, sanctions, uh, so forth and so on. Next slide. Provider relations staff, um, Nebraska Total Care, will have dedicated uh, behavioral health specific provider relations staff. In fact, several of them are in the onboarding process as we speak. So you'll begin to hear from them as they reach out to you to get to know you and you get a chance to get to know us. Uh, as part of their duties, um, they will be working with you on any credentialing items that occur um, pre and post implementation. They can discuss with you any claims activity, how to bill, provide one-on-one -on -one education. And in those instances when you want to request adding or deleting a physician or a practitioner from your group, we do have um, a number that you can call us um, to get real-time assistance now and then we'll connect you with these local staff um, once they're through their onboarding and my team is also able to help you through any of the contracting and credentialing questions you may have. Next slide. Each provider will have um, a Nebraska Total Care Provider Network Specialist assigned to you. That team will serve to provide as the liaison between you and the plan. So as I mentioned earlier, they'll be providing education discussing HEDIS care gaps with you, 
financial analysis, assisting providers with any e um, electronic health record utilization, demographic updates, initiating credentialing of new providers, facilitation of inquiries related to administrative policies, procedures, and operational issues. They'll also be monitoring performance patterns and providing that feedback to you as well. And they will also assist you with provider portal registration and pay span so that you can submit electronic uh, claims as well as electronic funds transfer for your payment. Next slide. To assist providers in all of this process, we do have uh, a website and secure protocols um, uh, tools that are out there on the portal. Next slide. So as part of these web-based tools, we have a public site, which is nebraskatotalcare.com. Here you can provide in, or receive information regarding medical services, a copy of the provider manual, the specific billing manual, authorization code checker, um, forms for prior, author prior authorization, clinical practice guidelines, any plan news, as well as the find the provider. Nebraska Total Care is committed to enhancing our web-based tools and technology, and we are open to any of your suggestions on enhancements to our portal. And again, there's a telephone number here for you to contact us. So this number is not yet active until the go live, but we have provided you with an alternate number in the meantime, which is also in this presentation. Next slide. Through this portal, you'll be able to check member eligibility, patient listings, health records, care gaps, authorizations, submit claims and the status of those claims, you can correct claims here, do any adjustments here, look at your payment history. And then for any, any agencies on this call today that also have primary care physicians, you can see PCP cost reports. We also want to mention that this registration is free and you can contact your provider network specialist to get started. Next slide. Through the provider um, portal, there are also a series of reports that are available to Nebraska Total Care's providers. Um, a couple of things to note. In an integrated model, we do know that sometimes the behavioral health provider is the primary person managing the member's care because behavioral health may be their primary diagnosis. To that end, we allow the providers for behavioral health to see the care gaps that also may be physical health care gaps. And we want to make sure that as behavioral health providers are working with members that they know when to refer a member over to their PCP for any gaps in care such as mammograms, EPS, DT events, et cetera. So all of our providers will be able to see all of these care gaps. You'll also be able to see emergency room utilization, member care plans, and then there's also claim reports for both physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy, and any, any high cost claims. Next slide. At this time, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Julie Rothacker so she can talk to you about the clinical parts of our program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Rothacker, and I am the um, Senior Director of Business Development and Clinical Implementation for Nebraska Total Care. And I want to talk a little bit about our clinical program today, as Michelle said. And so this will include information about utilization management, care management, and some of our specific programs around um, clinical care. Next slide. So our levels of care management include care coordination, care management, complex care management, and also disease management. And we have a multidisciplinary team that is made up of clinical and non-clinical staff from all disciplines, from physical health, behavioral health, to staff who are social workers and focus on um, the social determinants. Inclusive within this program is also a peer support liaison and some other um, member connections reps, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Our focus for our members within care management are, is on a holistic focus looking at their assessment and care plan based on the needs of the member, not just needs on of the basic diagnosis. Next slide. 
Included in our program are some of these particular um, diagnosis populations. And so this is primarily, this slide primarily focuses on our disease management program. And as you can see, again, very integrated in our approach. Obviously, any other individual who presents with care management needs will be assessed and evaluated for our chronic care management program, and that is inclusive of members with SPMI diagnoses. Next slide. We're very proactive in our identification of our members, and we look for resources not just from the member themselves, but also the providers, the hospital staff, any community agencies, stakeholders, family members, et cetera. We also do a lot of proactive member identification through some predictive modeling software that we have in um, looking specifically at some factors related to SPMI and being able to identify potential um, care gap issues and members that we're going to want to speak to in order to help get them linked with services. Next slide. Our members are um, contacted based on the level of acuity, and so our acuity ranges from low to moderate to high. And our most intensive level of care would be our chronic care management program, which could be anywhere from a daily outreach call to weekly, um, but absolutely no less than weekly. And at a minimum, we would be contacting any member in care management on a quarterly basis. Again, these are just minimum standards. It's all dependent on the member's need. Next slide. We do complete a variety of assessments for all of our members, and we can share this information with you as providers, um, and these are inclusive of both behavioral and physical health, um, including you know, some general risk screens and assessments to some screening tools that we have used to identify potential behavioral health needs, such as substance use and depression and anxiety. All of our care plans are created with our member and our family involved as appropriate, and we would look to share this information and receive the input from the providers as well. Next slide. Um, aside from the clinical care management program, we also do offer some uh, telephonic and in-person um, interpretive services. And so we do have two programs that we work with where the members and providers couldn't call to set up a face-to-face -face interpreter service five days prior to the appointment, or if they're on the phone and they need some assistance with interpretation, we also can offer that immediately. And our two companies is listed on this slide, our Voyance and Language Service Associates. And these can be arranged just by contacting our member services department. Next slide. Again, the integrated care team is really um, made up of the member as the primary focus, and all of the entities noted on this slide plus more would be included in um, that care management program and that team for the member. Next slide. And all of our staff are trained on not just these particular topics, but we highlighted some of these topics as we know that these are primary needs for our SPMI population. But every staff member for Nebraska Total Care, from our call center staff to you know our, our nurse case managers and our member connections reps, are given um, these trainings focusing on you know topics such as motivational interviewing, trauma informed care, recovery and resiliency, and even just the, the simple topic of you know signs and symptoms of, of behavioral health. Next slide. And quickly before we get to the contact information, I want to touch on uh, prior authorization for just a moment. Our prior authorization process is um, you can require you can request authorization through multiple means, through the provider portal, through a phone call, or through um, a fax system as well. And additional information will be provided in our um, individual provider orientations and on our website. We will have a grid located on our website that will give you the specific details as to what does and does not require prior authorization. And we encourage all providers to check this routinely in order to make sure that you're following the appropriate guidelines. And that information will be available on our website within the next couple of weeks to about a month. And now if you have any additional questions in the future, I am listed here as our main clinical contact. And then also we have our networking contracting and credentialing contact as well. Next slide. And that is the end of our presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Carmen. Thank you. Thank you, Well Care or Nebraska Total Care. Now we're going to move on to our question and answer portion. So we have a few that have been coming in during the presentations. Um, I can start by answering one question and reminding everyone that we're going to have all of the PowerPoints as well as the recording of today's presentations on our webpage. 
that's on the dhhs.nebraska.gov forward slash heritage health under resources. You will find all of the presentations from today's webinar as well as previous webinars. So I will let Heather go through the questions for you. Okay, thank you, Carmen. Our first question is directed to United Healthcare, so I will let them address it after I read them the question. Um, the question is, will provisionally licensed practitioners be allowed to credential with United Healthcare? Thank you, Heather. The answer to that is yes. United Healthcare is credentialing provisionally licensed clinicians. Thank you. The next one is from, I believe, what you all would consider a facility-based provider, but I will let you all speak to it once I read the question. Um, we operate a halfway house for women with substance problems. Two residents are on Medicaid. How can we sign up with an MCO? Um, the forms provided don't seem to address halfway house. What can we do? So I will let each of the MCOs answer that question, and we will start with United Healthcare. Uh, you could contact uh, our network directly at the network email and or phone numbers that were listed on our, our uh, slide and we'll, we'll work directly with this provider and assist them with getting in the network. Thank you. Now I'll let WellCare address that question. Um, we, we believe that it would fall under facility ancillary contracting, and if you don't have a contract from us, we encourage you to contact the, the email or the phone number that we've provided. Thank you. And Nebraska Total Care. We, we would do the same. It would be a facility-based contract and a facility-based application, and we'd be happy to assist you in the application completion process if you'd like, and you can contact us through that portal um, link, web, web access, web address. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind providers who are on the phone or who are listening in that we do, Nebraska Medicaid does have a requirement that the provider be enrolled as a Medicaid provider before they credential um, or contract with any of our health plans. So if you are not already enrolled in Nebraska Medicaid, you will need to complete that step before becoming credentialed with our health plans. Um, the next question. is related to um, injectable drugs, and I think I can go ahead and answer it. There are some expensive mental health injectable drugs that help compliance. Compliance will be comp compromised if MCO uses specialty pharmacy instead of local to dispense. Could specialty pharmacy not be allowed through Heritage Health MCOs? And so the response to that question is, is that specialty pharmacy is a component of our Heritage Health program. Um, and there was a, a, a pharmacy-specific webinar um, that was held last week, and so those materials are on our website at the address listed on your screen. So you can go to that and look at the, um, the, the presentations, but just for, all, for everyone to know that um, psychotropic um, injectable drugs are still a component and a benefit of the managed care or the heritage health plans, um, and they also will be um, allowing specialty pharmacies and specialty drugs in their network. The next question is specifically to WellCare, so I will let them address this question. Um, what is the EDI payer ID for WellCare? What is the EDI payer ID for WellCare? Um, I don't know that I know that off the top of my head, but I can try and get it while we're answering other questions. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about the CAQH. Are all three MCOs currently signed up with CAQH? The answer to that question is yes. Um, what you must do is make sure that your application in CAQH is up to date. 
and that you have allowed each of the Heritage Health Plans to view your, to um, access your information. The next question is both to WellCare and Nebraska Total Care, but it's already been asked of WellCare. So this next question will be for Nebraska Total Care. Does Nebraska Total Care have a payer ID yet? I don't know that I know the answer to that question either. So I can secure that and get back to you while we're answering these questions. Thank you. The next question, we are presently using Breakthrough, which is a computer-based telehealth program. Will something similar be able with Heritage Health? Because of the distance, this is very important to us. So um, I will explain to the Heritage Health plans, Breakthrough is actually a software and technology used by our current managed care entity for behavioral health. So I will ask that each of the health plans talk about their telehealth um, programs and capabilities, um, starting with United Healthcare. Thank you. United Healthcare contracts directly with providers for telemental health. They do uh, need to meet the state standards. Uh, and we do have services to, to assist with providers that are interested in uh, and needing some assistance with equipment. If that's, if that's an issue, we do have some options available for that. Well, Kara, can you address your telehealth um, and, uh, capabilities? Yes. Um, well, Kara also will contract with providers for telehealth services. Uh, we, as part of a comprehensive network, would also be uh, contracting potential uh, vendor resources if uh, there is not enough uh, telehealth resources in a, in a market. So we do access through that way, and we would be happy to uh, contract with you directly if you provide those services. And Nebraska Total Care. We will contract with providers who have telehealth capabilities today and work with those who would like to explore further telehealth capabilities. We're, we're open to several options with providers. Thank you. The next question is, do you know if you will be covering the evidence-based service of PCIT for provisionally licensed mental health provider? Or practitioners. Um, currently with Magellan, only LMHPs are allowed to bill for this service. Um, the parent-child interaction therapy is a service within the Heritage Health Plan's benefit package, so they will be covering it. And um, unless I speak, unless one of the health plans wants to speak differently, I, I believe that each of the health plans will be reimbursing provisionally licensed mental health practitioners for services of behavioral health. Um, if, it, But they would also, I mean, the provisionally licensed mental health practitioners would have to have a supervising practitioner. So um, I will pause briefly to see if any of the health plans want to add anything or speak differently to that answer. Uh, well, WellCare is in agreement with you. Nebraska Total Care is following along the same lines. Uh, healthcare will follow state direction as well. Thank you. And I believe that the next question was answered by the first question. Um, will WellCare, in Nebraska, WellCare of Nebraska and Nebraska Total Care credential provisionally licensed mental health practitioners as well? And that the answer to that question is yes. The next question, will non-licensed staff, such as community support workers who need to be individually enrolled, need NPI number, et cetera, with Medicaid and with MCOs? And I do believe that the answer to that question is no. I do believe we have certain, um, certain provider types that are considered atypical and community support providers are considered atypical. Um, so they can enroll as an atypical provider with Medicaid, which will allow them to be credentialed with our MCOs. 
The next question, many of our clients do not bring their ID cards to their visits. We currently rely on Medicaid's D1 system to verify eligibility. Will providers still be able to utilize the system to determine which MCO the plan the client is enrolled in? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, the Nebraska eligibility, I can't remember what it's called, the NIMS line, <laughs> our, our inquiry tools, the current inquiry tools that do identify the current health plan enrollment will identify the heritage health plan enrollment after January 1. So all of our eligibility tools through our um, phone lines, through our online portals, um, and through the 271, 271 transactions will identify the, medic, uh, the health plan enrollment of our Medicaid clients. The next question, are there specifics regarding the initial psych assessment and initial diagnostic assessments required by each plan? Medicaid uses some H codes for these services and have claim edits to deny claims when these codes have not been entered. Um, I will let each of the MCOs address that particular question, um, but I also believe that that could be something that could be followed up in an a subsequent um, webinar with our health plans when they do their specific um, provider billing um, orientation webinar or, or orientation sessions. But again, I'll read the question again so each of the health plans can respond. Are there specifics regarding the initial psych assessment and initial diagnostic assessment required by each plan? Medicaid uses some H codes for these services and have claims edit to deny claims when these codes have not been entered. And I will let United Healthcare respond to that first. Um, so uh, nothing that's plan specific. However, we would follow what is required as part of the service definitions for a particular service related to assessment expectations. And that would inform uh, our processes uh, related to what is required from a documentation perspective. Uh, we also look forward to collaborating around uh, service definitions uh, as we continue uh, throughout the implementation process. Thank you, Adam. That did remind me, I do want to let the providers know that we are, Medicaid is working together with our health plans and also with our Division of Behavioral Health to, um, to revise our service definitions um, and to, we are collaborating to ensure that we're all developing service definitions that are all in alignment, and once those service definitions are finalized, we will post those to our website. But Adam is correct in the fact that we do have some of our services that require an initial diagnostic exam or an interview, an IDI, before that service is to be rendered so that each of the managed care plans would be um, developing their claims edits in in, in compliance with our service definitions. So, um, well, Carol, I don't know if you, Carol, if you wanted to add anything more to that. Yeah, I just, um, without a little more specificity, if you have assessment codes that are allowed on the 9,000 CPT, we will allow those, but we would also follow the pretty much the state's requirements on the H and T codes. Um, that are used for behavioral health. So we will look at the claims edits that the states have, and the state has, and we will then uh, build our structure. And I agree, talking about that in more specificity in our provider, uh, subsequent provider issues group, as well as our, um, our provider trainings that are related to claims specifically is, is a place to go with that. In Nebraska Total Care, is there anything you wanted to add to any of our conversation related to this? No, Nebraska Total Care will utilize the service and the expectations um, the same as what the state has. The next question has to do with the Client Assistance Program Service. Will the three plans offer CAP services for provisionally licensed mental health practitioners and licensed mental health practitioners? which allow providers to see clients until their supervisor can do so, can do the MSE. 
Um, and the response to this question really is we are still in discussions in collaboration with each of the health plans as to the coverage of this service. So that is still an under review and the answer is we're still under review with the service and we'll um, provide more information as we get closer to go live. The next question is how does care coordination compare to our current community support service? Um, I'll go ahead and let United Healthcare begin and then we'll see if any of the, if WellCare or Nebraska Total Care want to add um, any other comments to, to United Healthcare's response. And again, the question is how does care coordination compare to our current community support service? Um, our care coordination is in no way uh, designed to be duplicative or any type of replacement for the current work that the case managers do within the community. It's really to support uh, that work between the clinician, the community support worker, the other system partners, coordinators, uh, to have an integrated care plan in place and have uh, consistent communication so that everyone involved in the member's cases is plugged into what's going on and function as a liaison then within the health plan to help navigate through the system. So certainly uh, no duplication and, and really there to be a supplemental support to the community support workers in the community out there. Carol, was there anything you wanted to add? No, it, it's the same for well care. And Nebraska Total Care. Yep, Nebraska Total Care's care management program is also supplemental to the primary care, our primary providers in the community. Thank you. The next question is how often can a recipient change plans? So when our Heritage Health program goes live on January 1, all of our members will have the opportunity to change their plan for any reason in the first three months, so for January, February, and March. And then at the, um, in fourth quarter of 2017 will be our open enrollment period. Um, so after March, um, when April begins, our clients will be locked into their health plan until our open enrollment period later in 2017. Um, so members will be afforded the opportunity to change their, health, change their health plan once a year during our open enrollment period. There are certain circumstances which we call for cause, um, reasons why um, a member may be allowed to change their health plan outside of the open enrollment opportunities, um, but those, and those are defined in um, the Nebraska Medicaid regulations, and those must be approved by um, state Medicaid staff. The next question is directed to Nebraska Total Care and WellCare. Will Nebraska Total Care and WellCare use the Nebraska member ID or will they use a new ID number? And I will let WellCare answer that question first. Um, is that a, on a claim? Is that for the claim? I would Fine. say on the claim but in their member ID card too. Um, I am going to have to find out and, and get that answer back because I, I don't have anyone here with me that would, would have the specifics on the member ID. If I, if I can get it back before we finish, I will. Otherwise, I will submit to you the answer. Thanks, Carol. Nebraska Total Care? We utilize the Nebraska Medicaid ID number. Great, thanks. The next question is, since community support workers are considered atypical providers, will they need to credential through CAQH? And I do want to um, emphasize that CAQH is not a requirement for providers to, um, for the credentialing process. The CAQH process is one of our um, administrative simplification processes that if a provider is able to and has already loaded their information into CAQH, um, our, provide, 
our, our managed care plans, our heritage health plans, will use that information as part of, as their source verification and their credentialing. Um, so CAQH is just one tool in the contracting and credentialing process through Heritage Health. Um, and if, and we, and I do want to use this opportunity to let people know that Provider Bulletin 16-14 is on our website. Um, it was issued May 27th of 2016, and it does provide the contact information for each of our health plans for credentialing and contracting, and also provides information around CAQH. So we actually, through that bulletin, have the web address for CAQH, and I would encourage providers who are interested in um, that avenue, if they not, are not already, to use the information provided on the CAQH um, website and also to use those for specific questions about how to become um, enrolled in CAQH. Okay, I have one question left. It is back to telemental health, please. With the use of breakthrough, the client can be in their home, car, or a park and use a laptop, tablet, or smartphone to, lead, to have a session. Will this be allowed going forward or will it have to be point to point? Um, I will let each of the managed care plans address this question, and I'll read it again after I talk, but I do want to let everyone know that um, the Nebraska Medicaid regulations are being revised and they will be effective for January 1 when we go live with telehealth to, uh, or with Heritage Health, excuse me, to allow more flexibility around telehealth services. So. Um, as far as the regulations are concerned, the home, car, park, laptop, tablet, smartphone sessions will be allowed in our Medicaid regulations. Um, Magellan is actually providing them today as value add services, but I will let each of the health plans address this question and I will read it one more time. Back to telehealth. Back to telemental health, will the use of break, with the use of breakthrough, the client can be in their home, car, or a park and use a laptop tablet or smartphone to have a session. Will this be allowed going forward or will it have to be point to point? United Healthcare? United Healthcare will follow the state regulations as they're revised. Wellcare? Uh, same for Wellcare and if it's if it's allowable in the state, we would allow it. And Nebraska Total Care. Same for us, we'll follow the state regulations. Okay, I do not see any more questions coming up in our question and answer boxes, so thank you for joining us today. Again, quick reminder, this presentation, the slides and the uh, audio will be posted to our Heritage Health website, which is on your screen. Um, usually within the next couple of days, you can subscribe to that page and every time we update that page, which includes posting these materials, um, on our website, or which includes posting these materials from today's webinar, you will receive an email notifying you that we have updated our web page, and you can go and see what our, 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 our changes are. And then also that provider bulletin again is 1614 on our website, and it was issued in May 27th. And we've had one more question come up, so we'll keep doing Q&A. Um, currently when a client loses and then regains Medicaid eligibility, they typically have a period of fee-for-service eligibility. Will this continue under Heritage Health or will they be immediately re-enrolled in the MCO plan? Um, so under our Heritage Health program, we will have immediate enrollment um, and we also will have retro um, enrollment into a health plan up to three months prior. So if a person, if a member loses their Medicaid eligibility for a period of a couple months and then they're re-enrolled or they become eligible and re-enrolled, their enrollment will go will go back and we will not have a period of fee-for-service eligibility.
Okay, thank you everyone for all of your good questions. Thank you to our health plan and to Carmen for the presentation and um, look, we'll look forward, please look forward to having these, this presentation um, posted to our website soon. Thank you everyone.